everyone, welcome to Upfront. I'm Kang Tae. We've uh, recently seen quite a flurry of uh, diplomatic actions from the APAC summit in Beijing to the G20 summit in Australia. And today we're asking how the Northeast Asian dynamics so will be affected by the series of talks among world leaders. And uh, we, of course, as every other week, have a great panel of experts in the studio joining us for this uh, Upfront conversation. First of all, Mr. Mr. Uh, Kim hyun uh, Director General of the Department of American Studies at Korea National Diplomatic Academy, who is also an expert when it comes to Korea-U.S. Uh, relations. And uh, to my right, uh, Professor Jin Kai, uh, an expert in uh, Chinese uh, diplomacy, uh, research fellow at the Center for International Studies at Yonsei University. And of course, Mr. Ji jung soo Co-President uh, of uh, Sustainable Development Global Network. So uh, before uh, we go any deeper, uh, let's uh, rewind just a little bit and look back at these uh, world leaders' hectic schedule and some of the striking moments, I would say, in their political maneuvering. Take a look. Leaders from more than 20 countries have gathered for diplomatic talks over the past two weeks, and the starting point was the APEC Forum in Beijing. Multilateral forums like this are arranged around very tight schedules, and the leaders use the opportunity to hold summit talks. Some of the bilateral summit talks were scheduled beforehand, but most are multilateral involving the leaders of numerous countries. Some leaders had a chance to meet and have short discussions. That's why multilateral diplomacy is often described as a diplomatic battlefield without a gunshot. Multilateral talks between three countries in particular have been frequent and wide-ranging over the past week. Through multilateral diplomacy, Korea has concluded negotiations on a free trade agreement with China. The president has also spearheaded efforts for other issues, including North Korea's nuclear program, investment, strategic partnerships among nations, and national security concerns. Every single move made by Seoul, Beijing, Tokyo and Washington has garnered global attention because of the impact on Northeast Asia. From strained relations between Korea and China on one side and Japan on the other due to historical and territorial disputes, as well as the battle for supremacy between the U.S. and China. The economic, security and diplomatic relationships in Northeast Asia have shifted in the recent meetings. Drastic achievement, poor treatment, fight for supremacy, different positions, improved relations. Many words and phrases have been used to describe the recent summits and forums. We discuss the expected impact they will have on Northeast Asia. All right, so a big diplomacy week for uh, many Asian countries in particular, I would say, multilateral, bilateral. But I would think that bilateral meetings are uh, the ones that actually see a lot of results. They get things done, I think. So, Professor uh, Kim, uh, first of all, which one did you like the best or did you pay most attention to? Uh, yes, I think that there were many meetings, bilateral meetings at, at APEC especially. Um, the most important one, I think, was definitely Obama-Xi Jinping meeting. Mm. Uh, they are two great uh, superpowers, also agreed upon no use of military forces each other. Mm. Uh, but I think uh, what has been most impressing, impressive meeting was China-Japan meeting. Mm. I mean, uh, we had a, a high, high degree of tensions between China and Japan and also China, you know, Japan and Korea. And it had uh, been a sudden uh, meeting that uh, nobody has expected that to be uh, achieved. So I think that was uh, one of the surprising moments that I had. Yes, yeah, so it was surprising indeed how mm -hmm. um, he was greeted by mm -hmm. uh, Chinese President sure. uh, Xi Jinping with a very cold face there too, right? So uh, what, what did you think about uh, this past week and uh, what stood out to you to, uh, the most in terms of bilateral meetings? Well. Um I would say uh, the bilateral talks between President Xi Jinping and Obama. Mm, you too that, as well. Yeah, seized my uh, most attention. Mm -hmm. Well, the two summit talks, first in APEC, they had this uh, walk and talk as they did before in Edinburgh retreat in 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second one, well, actually, the second one, I think it, it is more interesting. 
during mm. uh, Obama's state visit in Beijing. Mm. Okay. Well, the uh, message we can read from this uh, from this uh, state visit mm -hmm. was very important. Mm. For example, the three are commitment Obama made to be, to Xi Jinping. Um, mm. Well, that is uh, actually related to uh, the construction of bilateral relations. Mm. For example, a new type of great power relations between China and the U.S. And uh, well, it seems like people start to think maybe um, rebalance policy mm. has been pushing new type of great power relations into the corner, and this somehow show us the hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so both of you guys um, paid a lot of attention to the U.S.-China summit, but what started all this uh, flurry of diplomatic actions was actually South Korea-China mm -hmm. summit right before the APAC summit uh, began. Um, do we read into this uh, the order of the summits that uh, Xi Jinping has lined up? Well, I think yes in some sense mm -hmm. because now uh, you, you know, Korea-China relation is re really good. Um, of course, uh, each country has its own national interest vis-a-vis -vis each other. Korea definitely wants to increase uh, trade surplus from China, mm -hmm. along with uh, some of the influences that China can exert on North Korea. Also, China also has a very big interest from Korea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, before, North Korea has been an important buffer state to, to, to China, but I think uh, as uh, Xi Jinping government's foreign policy is becoming more and more global, I think uh, China needed to find some more positive buffer state mm -hmm. instead of negative buffer state, which has been mm. uh, you know, done by, by, by North Korea. And also, um, the reason why China thinks uh, you, you know, China-North Korea relation is very pivotal to China is because when after unification is you know achieved in the Korean Peninsula, okay. China does not want to leave next to next door to you know the U.S. Korea alliance. Mm -mm -mm. So I think um, it's more on the side of China that wants a closer relationship between Korea and J Korea and China mm -hmm. rather than you know from the Korean mm. side. And uh, from my perspective, it looks like the South Korea-China free trade agreement, the announce of the conclusion of the deal, was sort of the highlight, of, wasn't it, of their summit. But what would be the diplomatic and political implications of this uh, free trade agreement? Take out the trade part of the deal. What does this mean for the bilateral relations? Well, think about the triangle between among South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Mm -hmm. Probably the weakest link is Japan mm -hmm. and South Korea. Mm -hmm. So maybe China somehow find the weakest point to drag South Korea to Beijing mm -hmm. side, okay. and that somehow created some kind, some kind of a counter effect. Mm. Okay, so I mean, you seem to be in line with many other experts that I've been talking to or reading about. Um, actually. Uh, some expert here uh, from the Asan Institute for Policy Studies, for one, it was saying that China wanted to bring South Korea closer to China's side, thinking about the big world order picture. Do you agree with it? Um, compared to Hu Jintao period, the current Xi Jinping government's mm. foreign policy mm. is different from previous Hu Jintao period in the sense that now China wants to be a rule maker. Mm -hmm. You know, before uh, China was behaving and try to increase its uh, you know, right to speak, right to do something globally mm -hmm. uh, within the systems right. made by the United States, which is called as Bretton Woods system. Mm -hmm. But now China wants to build its own system, you know, beginning from the Asian Infra Investment Bank, mm -hmm. uh, you know, RCEP and FTAAP, all that kind of things. And uh, I think one of the uh, uh, issue that was included in the uh, you know, China-Korea FTA this time was that um, Korea needs to increase the uses of yuan in the currency of China mm -hmm. within you know Korean territory, mm -hmm. which means that uh, you know China wants to increase the uses of its uh, own currency vis-a-vis -vis dollar mm -hmm. in the global you know territory. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's one of the uh, you know signals we can see from Chinese foreign policy, mm. as you mentioned, it's okay. trying to increase its uh, influences, not only 
on, on South Korea, but also on a lot of other countries. Okay, so do we have a consensus, in Mr. Ryu? Well, in terms of the, uh, the game that we call the diplomatic gameplay, right. the divide and conquer is a concept that often played. I mean, certainly the North Korea has been very good at this, but mm. China also seemed that to have bring Korea closer to the China, and uh, they're little, making little distance from the U.S. and uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. This is what I think the part where the economic-driven uh, relationship, where that really this is people to the point between the mm -hmm. China and the Korea. Okay, and many South Korean uh, media reports are worried, uh, concerned that South Korea might be sort of stuck in this uh, two superpowers, G2 nations. Mm -hmm. Is it stuck? Yeah, I don't think it's stuck. Okay. Well, it really depends on the angle and uh -huh. perspective you have. You may say uh, pinched or stuck in between mm -hmm. the U.S. and China, or you may say um, putting eggs in two baskets. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So uh, this is not great power, uh, power games. Mm -mm -mm. It's a game among all of us. Mm -hmm. Play the game smartly, and then you may win. Okay. What do you think? Well, I'm sorry. I have a little different opinion from yours. That's great um, for me. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S., China, mm -hmm. Korea all have different interests. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why their policies are all different all the time. Um, what U.S. wants from Korea now is to use Korea for its people policy, Asia mm -hmm. rebalancing policy. Now the United States has its uh, own political economic problems, uh, has very uh, low defense budget, um, also needs to uh, increase its naval forces, 60% of naval forces into Asia. But in order for that, what U.S. needs now is a desperate support from its allies. Mm. Um, okay, how about China? Mm. China always are, you know, fearful of U.S. policies. Uh, China, uh, China always try to use North Korea as, you know, buffer state vis-a-vis -vis the United mm -hmm. States. But as we have witnessed in 2010, when there were conflicts between North and South Korea, like a Chonan ship, right. Yongpyeong Island, mm -hmm. all that kind of things. That kinds of uh, provocations of North Korea actually uh, induced and brought U.S. intervention in, 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 in Korean mm. Peninsula, which has been an indirect, you know, intervention right, on towards China. Chinese affairs, mm -hmm. which makes the China you know, get angry about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I think China began to think negative, negatively about the role of North Korea and began to think of South Korea as another mm -hmm. new buffer state. Mm -hmm. So that's why China is trying to bring South Korea into its own side. Mm -hmm. So United States and South China has all different interests mm -hmm. on South Korea. So is that the pulse that we all got last week? I mean, um, some of the media reports were talking about how Obama, I mean, it really depends on how they're doing in terms of domestic politics in their own countries, too. So some actually, um, some headline called Obama beleaguered as opposed to confident Xi Jinping. How are they really doing in terms of their, you know, domestic support when it comes to the global stage? Well, uh, how to say, uh for many years, uh, the world has been saying like uh, China should be a responsible great power. Mm -hmm. But how? How to be a responsible great power? There got to be chances, new roles for a rising economic great power. Right. So this is the moment for China to find um, new opportunities mm. to find a different approach mm. to be a great power, not mm. through military, not through walls, mm -hmm. but through making new rules, mm. and not making rules independently but mm. collectively. Okay. It seems that the, I agree with the part of <coughs> what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. China really worked hard to show themselves itself as a, a, a responsible, accountable, reliable, mm -hmm. the G2 country. Mm -hmm. Where also Obama would like to work out the, his image that they send the, the team, the working on the many days to really make reach out the, this climate change-related mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. And this is how I think both leaders wanted to really show they do have a clear idea how 
they would like to work together mm. on urgent global issue. Mm. It almost looked like Obama really needed to show something to the outside world right. when it comes to his uh, diplomatic maneuvering, and it's almost looked like Xi Jinping has just sort of opened the gateway for right. Obama to do that this time around. Uh, that's uh, at least my personal take. Now, uh, taking center stage, though, in these uh, G2 nations race for, for power and a greater influence in this uh, region is China's uh, growing economic weight, of course, and recent trade and finance initiatives. Uh, take a look at this uh, next report. The one area receiving the most attention was the economy, which has been at the focal point of a confrontation between the U.S. and China, the world's two major powers. At the closing ceremony of the 22nd APEC, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced the start of the Free Trade Area of the Asia-Pacific, or FTAAP, process. The reason for the attention on the FTAAP is that it was suggested by China as a counter to the U.S.-led Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. If and when all 12 nations that are participating in the TPP negotiations sign an agreement, it would create the world's largest free trade zone with about 40% of the global economy accounted for. However, the goal of the U.S. to reach an agreement before the 22nd APEC meeting failed. Amid the setbacks, China has proposed a new trade bloc, leaving the United States out. This, of course, was not a welcome move from Washington's point of view. Chinese President Xi also stressed a need to establish a new economic order at the G20 meeting in Australia and emphasized the need for FTAAP to strengthen China's leadership in the global economy. Well, frankly, the United States is concerned about Korea joining the AA. IIB, simply put, is they are looking at, well, they're wanting to keep Korea out of the sphere of China's influence as much as possible. Um, right now, the whole balancing act that, that Korea has been having to take between China and the United States has been, it's been a hard balancing act. And the United States obviously wants to keep Korea on their side. So right now, this has been a big issue. And this is why even the United States is saying, look, Korea, just stay with us. Stay on our side. Don't go over to the dark side of the force, so to speak, at least from their point of view. Korea has also been careful about clarifying its position. China and the U.S. have both urged Korea to participate in the trade negotiations led by them. The China-led FTAAP, or the U.S.-led TPP, now is the time for Korea to make a decision. So certainly China seems to be pushing for its way of doing things, right, when it comes to trade and finance. And, you know, we cannot really take those two elements out of uh, world uh, politics these days. Do you think the the tit for tat for, for between these G2 nations could be a risk factor, uh, potentially leading to instability or uncertainty in this region? Many experts in the United States made it clear that U.S. Uh, policy towards Asia, rebalance towards Asia is a long-term policy mm -hmm. uh, and their focus will be only on diplomatic and economic aspects. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, now it's more on the economic, you know, aspects that right. had uh, flared, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, conflicts between the United States and China, mm -hmm. like whether it's FTAP versus TPP, something like that. So I think in that sense, we still have some leeway to, to manage the current situations. Um, but still, I think uh, as China is now trying to expand its sphere based upon its own economic and political international you know, system, um, and also U.S. trying to move slowly but gradually into Northeast Asia, uh, kind of trying to deter and, and, and you know, contain China, mm. I think uh, their conflict will be, I think, more and more severe, mm. which uh, I don't think is a good signal for Korea's mm. uh, national interest. Okay. Uh, Professor, Beijing's rise, Washington's pivot to Asia, combine those two, and what do we have in, in this uh, Northeast Asian region? Then we have China's cautious confidence. Mm. Well, it's been rising out rapidly, but still, mm -hmm. I think uh, China has been very cautious Mm -hmm. to use its power, economic power, mm -hmm. and especially regarding uh, military power, right. has been relatively cautious if we compare to the behavior of great powers before. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so that is why um, the, the principle for China's foreign policy is something like uh, to uh, find common commonality, commonality and uh, to reserve the differences. Mm. Then how do we maneuver this? I mean, how does South Korea maneuver this? When two great superpowers have a bad relationship, mm -hmm. that's no good for Korea's <laughs> national interest. Right. If their relationship is really good, mm -hmm. that's also not good for Korea's exactly. national interest. Mm -hmm. 2010, you know, China and United States had a very, very bad relationship mm -hmm. in, in many, many, import, many important global issues, also including Korean Peninsula issues. Mm -hmm. um, also, at the same time, you know, North Korean military provocation made the U.S. aircraft carrier come into the Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. which was a very sensitive move to Chinese mm -hmm. interests. So at that time, with conflicts between U.S. and China, you know, Korean Peninsula has been in you know, arena for their own conflict. So I'm going to bring this uh, conversation to the elementary level of uh, question. Which country does South Korea would benefit m more <laughs> from a stronger ties? If you can shake hand with China, probably the United States will not be happy. Mm -hmm. If you give a hug to the United States, China will not be happy. Mm -hmm. So you always have this dilemma. Mm -hmm. So why don't you shake hand with North Korea? Mm -hmm. I mean. North Korea, uh, inter-Korean relationship could be a very important and uh, influential oh, variable okay. in this region. Mm -hmm. Once you have a better relationship, I mean, China will, will not say no, mm -hmm. and the United States will not say no. Mm -hmm. We have no reasons to say no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so play the North Korea card yes. when it comes to maneuvering between the G2 but, nations. But that is a practically, reality-wise, we mm -hmm. have a problem there. As long as North Korea keeps this uh, nuclear development, mm. how China or U.S. Mm. is uh, happy with the North South Korea work with the North Korea? Sometimes I feel like um, we don't really have the long-term roadmap. It really depends on what China decides to do, what uh, the U.S. decides to do, or how Japan decides to do. So um, it's uh, certainly a dilemma. So I guess that that's going to be have to be the conclusion that we um, move uh, forward with. Now, in this uh, tit for tat for power and influence in this uh, region between the U.S. and China, there is another country, of course, that stays very much relevant in this power game in its own interesting way, and that is Japan. The leaders of China and Japan finally met. The awkward handshake between the two leaders epitomizes their current state of bilateral relations. Both South Korea and China have been at odds with Japan amid historical and territorial disputes. As a result, trilateral summit talks among the three countries haven't taken place since May 2012. Ice-breaking talks between Beijing and Tokyo garnered a lot of attention, especially because Tokyo has agreed to a four-point consensus principle suggested by Beijing. The world has paid close attention to the possibility of a Seoul-Tokyo summit. President Pakune and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe were seated side by side at an APEC dinner and briefly discussed a range of issues, including Director General talks on the wartime sexual enslavement issue. President Park suggested a trilateral summit among South Korea, China and Japan during the ASEAN Plus Three summit in Myanmar. It was only two days after the impromptu meeting with Abe. <laughs> Japan and the U.S. have shown a positive response to President Park's proposal, but there are still a lot of challenges considering the conflicts Japan faces with both South Korea and China. Now, all eyes turn to Japan and its diplomatic maneuver with South Korea and China in the lead-up to the proposed three-way summit. 
And to get an insight on Japan's role and future in the Northeast Asian region, uh, Professor Ryu Yongwook from Australian National University is joining us on the show. Professor, thanks so much for coming on to our program today. Now, first question, uh, Japan is playing hard to get when it comes to uh, the U.S.-led trade pact, the TPP. Do you think that can pose as a source of conflict down the road? No, I don't think so. Uh, different government bureaucracies are in charge of different issues, and economic issues are generally separated from political and military issues. So I don't think hard bargaining between USA and Japan over the TPP will affect their close military relationship. If anything, um, I think uh, their improving military ties will have positive effects in their economic cooperation and negotiation over TPP. Okay, and so given the current dynamics, what kind of game Japan do you think is playing? Um, so in broad terms, Japan is taking a strategy known as hedging in international relations. So on the one hand, Japan engages with China economically, reaping benefits from trade and investment. While on the other hand, Japan is developing uh, closer military ties with the United States and other regional countries such as the Philippines just in the case that China's rise brings trouble to Japan. Now, in this sense, Japan is very similar to all regional countries and would like to see stable U.S.-China relations, which overall uh, will benefit Japan the most. But unlike most countries, Japan uh, is very clear that it will side with the United States in a potential military conflict between USA and China. And China-Japan relations have cooled a bit due to territorial and uh, historical disputes. If their bilateral relations improve, what kind of effect will that bring to the Northeast Asian region? First of all, uh, it will bring greater peace and stability to Northeast Asia as military tensions between the two countries will decrease. Uh, in addition, I think improving bilateral ties between China and Japan will put greater pressure on uh, Seoul uh, uh, to improve its own ties with Japan. And you know, as we've seen that President Park has already made a suggestion that trilateral summit should be held uh, between China, Japan and South Korea uh, as soon as possible. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not going to be easy. Uh, as we've seen in the immediate aftermath of the APEC uh, meetings, when the Japanese government announced that there is no dispute over the Senkakus or Tiaudao, the Chinese government immediately expressed its discontent. And nationalism is rising in both countries, and it's a key factor affecting their foreign policy towards each other. So I anticipate the bilateral relationship will face a you know, rather bumpy ride in the future. All right, thank you so much, Professor. Got to leave it there. Uh, Professor Ri Yongwook there from Australian National University. So as uh, he has been uh, talking about, you know, the three countries' dynamics between South Korea, China, and Japan, there were a lot of awkward moments, as we briefly mentioned earlier on, but they did manage to hold the summits uh, separately. Uh, but there are still hard feelings left. Yes, I think as far as uh, historical and mass issues are concerned, their meetings are very uh, skeptical too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we have to think about some of the strategic interests we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, first, let me begin with China-Japan interest. Why do you think mm -hmm. they had a summit meeting? I mean, if they're sticking to the historical issues, right. China definitely should not be uh, mm -hmm. you know, talking with uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe. Um, but I think there have been some strategic calculations China used in order to come up with some meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, first one is that now China wants to build its own you know, sphere of influence in Northeast mm -hmm. Asia. Um, and in order for that, you know, China needs to uh, kind of prevent and block some of the U.S. policies towards North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, because, and also the important tool for that kind of uh, U.S. policy is Japan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if Japan, if, if, if China kind of bring Japan and get along with Japan very well, then that means that I um, mean, uh, U.S. and Japan alliance would not be totally 100% enemy to China. Mm. So kind of blocking U.S. people policy is one, one uh, reason, I think. Mm. And, and second uh, reason, I think, is that um, from the Japanese side, um, 
of course, uh, Japan wants to remove historical animosity from China and Korea. Mm. But I think at the same time, Japan had some skepticism about the active role of the United States in Northeast Asia. Basically, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it is easy to say uh, Japan is one of the most important airlines to the U.S. in mm -hmm. Northeast Asia, but we can still can find some you know, problem between these two countries, mm -hmm. trust and distrust. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, Japan, Japanese may talk to Chinese, sometimes uh, Japanese may talk to the Americans. And what about the uh, summit talks between Beijing and uh, between the, uh, China and Japan? I don't think it's a really breakthrough. What about South Korea's role, I mean, place, position between China and Japan? It certainly looked like South Korea played, well, you know, President Park Geun-hye kept herself busy um, looking at what other leaders were doing and then trying to fit in a summit schedule here and there. Mm. Does this look like South Korea's um, attempt to avoid being a, a diplomatic outcast, at least? I mean, she sort of let go of her principled approach that, no, I'm not going to talk to Shinzo Abe for now unless the historical issues are addressed. But she did manage to have some dialogue, short conversation miss, with Mr. Abe. What do you think? Um, probably some media will say mm -hmm. uh, South Korea has been isolated, mm -hmm. but I don't think so. Okay. Um, apparently, China has been degraded. The summit talks between uh, Beijing and between Xi Jinping mm -hmm. and Abe. South Korean president uh, sitting down shortly, even if it was over a dinner with a Japanese prime minister, and also offering the trilateral summit talks with China and Japan. Do you think that's a shift from the initial South Korea's position? Um, I think we have to wait and see. As, okay. uh, as uh, have been men mentioned by Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Jinkai, mm -hmm. um, I think. Uh, the meeting itself between Japan and China was not very fruitful. Mm. Still, that's the very initial beginning of two countries' uh, summit meeting. Of course, uh, you know, Abe went into Japan, had a very uh, big media play about the positive role of Japan mm. in the meeting, but Chinese uh, side was very, uh, you know, scornish about that. Right. So I think we have to see how the Japan, you know, maintains and in, 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 abides by the agreement made by Xi Jinping and Abe. So we have to see how that goes on. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's one thing because, you know, based upon the result of China-Japan meeting, um, whether there will be a possible Japan-Korea meeting or not will be determined. Mm -hmm. But regardless of that, we have been consistently arguing for the necessity of trilateral summit meetings. Mm -hmm. It's not the first time we have been, in, you know, consistently you know, arguing for that from the past, mm. because I think that's not only good for bilateral terms, but also good for our own policies, like called Northeast Asia Peace and Initiative, Peace and uh, what is that? Uh, Peace and Cooperative Initiative. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. NAPSI. Yeah, in order for that, we need to begin from the trilateral cooperation. Uh, so do you think South Korean President Park Geun-hye proposing the three-way summit talks with China and Japan, uh, we are reading a lot into this, at least here in Korea. Uh, do you think that is showing a degree of flexibility towards Tokyo? Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, oh, we got a problem. We have to talk. Well, uh, we can't just postpone the, the talks, we can cancel the talks, and we can't just uh, you know, cancel the talk for the moment, mm -hmm. but the talks is really always on the list in right. the agenda. It's right. a must. Mm. Then what do we think about South Korea's so-called principled approach to Japan when it comes to historical issues and moving forward with a summit talk, bilateral one with the Japanese Prime Minister? Is this uh, pragmatic? Well, there have been an ongoing request for the current government to have a two-track approach to Japan. Mm -mm -mm. We definitely need to emphasize some of the historical issues between Japan and Korea, but at the same time, we have to think about security-related strategic interests we can get from the relationship. Mm. Uh, one thing I would like to say about the letter is, mm -hmm. whenever I visit Washington DC recently, mm -hmm. uh, the atmosphere about the you know, Japan-Korea relationship is uh, totally unexpected. I mean, many experts uh, say that, hey, we, you know, President Obama clearly mentioned 
about the uh, historical issues and wrongdoings by the Prime Minister Abe, mm -hmm. but we, we definitely uh, you know, think that there are much more strategic interests we can get from Japan. Mm -hmm. So as far as Korea-Japan relations is concerned, there are more opinions in DC that criticize the Korean side rather than the Japanese side. And uh, given all that, uh, some are actually asking whether we need more of the U.S. presence in the region given the complicated web of interests and historical differences among South Korea, Japan, and China. And for this question, John Pfeffer, co-director of Foreign Policy in Focus, is joining us. Uh, Mr. Pfeffer, thanks so much for joining us today. First of all, uh, tell us how you and or your colleagues assess uh, the diplomacy packed week for the leaders of South Korea, Japan, and China. Well, first of all, it, it was a, a, a lot going on at the APEC summit. And I think there were very high expectations. And many of those expectations were met. Uh, obviously, there, the, the biggest surprise was with the US and China on the climate deal. But there were some other surprises in there as well. And I think that for those of us who are hoping for more diplomacy and less tension uh, in East Asia, then the APEC summit was a victory for diplomacy. And given last week's uh, developments, how do you forecast uh, the dynamics between the U.S. and the three countries, uh, South Korea, Japan, and China, will shape up? Well, the United States clearly would like to have more coordination uh, between the three capitals, Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo. And Washington has been, shall we say, very disappointed with uh, the kind of Cold War, essentially, that has developed between uh, Seoul and Tokyo. But the fact remains that at a regional level in East Asia, the United States and China still have not quite figured out how to uh, negotiate their respective interests in the region. I think that's going to be the major challenge going forward, whether the United States and China can take the cooperation that they have at the global level and somehow translate it into the regional level. And if the two countries can do that, then I think we're not just talking about trilateral coordination between the United States and its allies on the one hand, and China working with, say, North Korea and Russia on the other in this kind of neo-Cold War divide in the region, what we'll see instead, if the United States and China can figure out a way to do this regionally, is actually some regional cooperation that cuts across this Cold War division. China very much would like to see some kind of regional security arrangement. Uh, this is something that South Korean government, Japanese government have talked about in the past, but whether we see it take place in reality remains to be seen. I see. All right. Um, let's leave it there for now. Thanks so much, Mr. Pfeffer, for your time and insights. Uh, John Pfeffer there joining us from Washington, D.C. Now, let's uh, move on to the next player in this region that did not exactly have to attend all these uh, summit meetings last week, but of course it managed to make so many headlines, and that is North Korea. Along with the multilateral diplomacy taking place at the 22nd APEC meeting in Beijing, there was breaking news. Chet discussed a wide range of issues including expanding economic cooperation and the UN resolution on human rights during his stay in Russia from November 17th to the 24th. The trip appears to be influenced by the recent flurry of multilateral diplomacy. There was no shortage of summits and meetings at the APEC and G20 forums, but the isolated North wasn't party to any of them. The North Korean nuclear and human rights issues were topics of conversation during summit talks between North Korea's neighbors, including South Korea, China, and Japan. There's a possibility that the North felt pressure due to the recent talks, so the Kim Jong-un regime decided to make use of its relationship with Russia, who also finds itself more and more isolated from the world.
North Korea finds itself isolated from the world while growing apart from China. What kind of impact will this bring to Northeast Asia? I mean, as I was saying earlier on, I mean, North Korea didn't have to be there. Uh, but uh, it garnered a lot of attention already and hogged many, many headlines. And when it comes to its human rights issues, um, I think, you know, the global community's pressure on this uh, human rights record is certainly building up. There is momentum, don't you think? And it's feeling the pressure. Doesn't it look like that? That, I think, is relevant to the current U.S. policy towards North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the Obama government's policy towards North Korea is very harsh. Mm. Uh, strategic patience, mm. but now it has evolved into a sanction-based harsh policy, hardline policy towards North Korea, right. which means that by strong sanctions, the U.S. wants to sharpen North Korea's choice. Mm -hmm. That's the you know, core of the current U.S. policy towards North Korea. Do you think uh, because North Korea's human rights issue is uh, discussed in the multilateral framework, uh, carrying on from the UN General Assembly and then now, you know, with the, you know, at, at these meeting venues with a lot of uh, media attention, global attention, do you think that could actually work on North Korea, that more pressure applied? Certainly. I mm. think the, a bit of reprise of what you said, it, was, it is the last thing that the U.S. can use. I think last, the most effective tool mm. that U.S. can use. Mm. The, certainly the, the showing of the North Korea releasing the two detainees mm -hmm. to um, the U.S., mm -hmm. I mean, certainly that's where the, they would like to build mm. uh, good image and good relationship with the, mm. uh, the America. Perhaps there are discussion about uh, not to bring them into international criminal court. Right. right? We'll so, give you the two detainees. Right, I mean, don't please take our We don't know whether that, uh, what kind of discussion uh, was going on behind the scene, mm. but certainly the pressure mm. is on North Korea mm. and uh, North Korea is doing mm. uh, whatever they can do to really diffuse this human rights issue and the international arena. Hmm. I mean, when it, yeah, so good thing you mentioned that. So Washington is talking to Pyongyang. I mean, right. I mean, it had to win the release of the two detainees or three in recent months, actually. Right. And China is actually talking to uh, uh, North Korea. Well, not China, but to Japan. And China is trading with North Korea, so in a high volume. Right. But South Korea is not. The high-level talks didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. So does this mean that South Korea needs to engage a little more with Pyongyang with a little more flexibility down the road? I mean, sometimes we want to have a dialogue with North Korea. Right. But sometimes, hey, um, you know, there were some possible North Korea uh, nuclear development provocations. Hey, we want to deter. We want to increase our military, mm -hmm. joint military exercise with mm -hmm. the United States. So we are, I, I'm, I don't know which way we're going to now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the short term, we have to do something, mm -hmm. you know, decide which one we're going to choose. Mm -hmm. So we have to do something. And then you were talking about earlier on the show that we have to play, South Korea has to play the North Korea card to increase its relevance, presence, and power in this region, what do we do with North Korea? Um, first, I think we should understand that North Korea is some, it's just like somebody sit, sitting in an empty room mm -hmm. in a corner, holding a key to the door, Ooh. and everybody outside said, okay, please open the door. Please give up your key. The key is something like a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we cannot promise what will happen to you, but we can promise new opportunities. I think that's a key point. Mm -hmm. They're worried about if I give out the key, then I'll lose everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in one of our earlier episodes here on this uh, upfront, a couple of weeks ago actually, we were talking about how North Korea, well, at least the younger generation, could be looking to change the regime, looking for different ways of living and doing things. In how, North Korean younger generation. Exactly, uh, how do we, at least in the multilateral diplomacy, because that's the big picture that we're talking about here, how do we galvanize changes in North Korea when it comes to the global meetings like APAC summit and G20? I think we have to think about some of the ways to exchange contact with North Korea, aiming mm -hmm. at achieving unification someday. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. um, 
I can't believe that still some people are still you know, believing in the fact that North Korean contingency would automatically leading to unification. That's impossible, mm -hmm. impossible, okay. you know, because of the influence of mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. If now is the time, like in early 1990s, mm -hmm. you know, U.S. enjoying its hegemonic status, mm -hmm. no other countries have influence on the Korean Peninsula. Maybe contingency would be uh, possibly leading to unification. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time it was possible, but now it's different. The only way we have to achieve unification now is to increase exchanges, change the, what people think in North Korea, you know, inculcate North Korean people how they can think about capitalism, you know, market system, market economic system. So I think in that way we have to change North Korean regime and change the way they think about the uh, you know, you know, system themselves. Right. I think that's the only way we can achieve unification. Mm. Yeah, that's the, the point where mm -hmm. that he mentioned uh, contingency wise. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there were talk between the Korea and the US that they bring China into this, mm -hmm. that to have, let's have three nations, let's mm -hmm. talk about contingency plan, mm -hmm. but China did not come mm -hmm. to the meeting. Mm -hmm. But certainly, as you mentioned, that the multi levels and the many at the, the, the ways we need to really build certain the economic development as well as the cultural changes. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly China must play important role in mm -hmm. terms of leading this per se. Mm -hmm. And if anything, I mean, China is growing uh, frustrated uh, with right. North Korea's behavior. That is mm -hmm. quoting many other yeah. experts that mm -hmm. I've been uh, talking mm -hmm. to. So it's such a tall task when it comes to North Korea every time we mention it. Mm -hmm. Now, so we have, uh, we've had a, quite a run talking about such a big picture, Northeast Asian uh, regions, uh, diplomacy and many dip bilateral uh, diplomacy and the multilateral framework. So now I want to sort of wrap this up and then get your final thoughts and maybe I will start off with uh, Mr. Du. Well, the, this region's growth is very important in whole worldwide. Mm -hmm. This is that the, the greatest the size of the economy in the world. Mm -hmm. We got to have peace in here, Northeast Asia region, and also we have to achieve the economically as well as the, the cultural, the leadership in this region. Let me just uh, <clears throat> describe the future of Asia Pacific region in two terms. I think mm -hmm. maybe uh, inclusive and comprehensive. Inclusive uh, it means it will have to be uh, including all the state member member states, poor, the rich, the developed, the underdeveloped, the developing countries, and uh, it should be comprehensive, not only economic issues but also political issues, security issues, gl global change, warm, global warming issues. So every mm -hmm. every issue should be uh, included, mm -hmm. and the great powers should be taking a uniquely important role. But at the same time, the middle powers, uh, all member states, should have this uh, 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 a new approach to find a joint, a uh, collective approach more that will work. Okay, yeah. so collective approach to things. And uh, Mr. Kim? Yes, I think multilateral diplomacy is important. Mm. We have been trying to have balanced approach to China and United States, maximizing our interests between U.S. and China. But I think uh, from the current state statuses and also the you know APEC and, and G20 and all these meetings, I think the moment that Ch Korea needs to, the moment that Korea is, you know, the both countries demands Korea to choose one side mm. is uh, getting closer. Yes, uh, many seem to agree with you actually. Um, South Korea is growing importance in this region uh, as a middle power and hopefully uh, coming up with the master plan uh, down the road. And thank you so much, all three of you, for coming into our studio and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, thank you, our viewers, for being with us this week as well. And join us again next time.